2 Samuel chapter 10. This is God's word, eternally true. In the course of time, the king of the Ammonites died, and his son Hanun succeeded him as king. David thought, I will show kindness, kindness to Hanun, son of Nahash, just as his father showed kindness to me. So David sent a delegation to express his sympathy to Hanun concerning his father. When David's men came to the land of the Ammonites, the Ammonite nobles said to Hanun, their lord, Do you think David is honoring your father by sending men to you to express sympathy? Hasn't David sent them to you to explore the city and spy it out and overthrow it? So Hanun seized David's men, shaved off half of each man's beard, cut off their garments in the middle at the buttocks, and sent them away. When David was told about this, he sent messengers to meet the men, for they were greatly humiliated. The king said, stay at Jericho till your beards have grown, and then come back. When the Ammonites realized that they had become a stench in David's nostrils, they hired 20,000 Aramean foot soldiers from Beth Rabab and Zobah, as well as the king of Maaka with a thousand men, and also 12,000 men from Tob. On hearing this, David sent Joab out with the ar entire army of fighting men. The Ammonites came out and drew up in battle formation at the entrance to their city gate, while the Arameans of Zobah and Rehob and the men of Tob and Maaka were by themselves in the open country. Joab saw that there were battle lines in front of him and behind him. So he selected some of the best troops in Israel and deployed them against the Arameans. He put the rest of the men under the command of Abishai, his brother, and deployed them against the Ammonites. Joab said, if the Arameans are too strong for me, then you are to come to my rescue. But if the Ammonites are too strong for you, then I will come to rescue you. Be strong. And let us fight bravely for our people in the cities of our God. The Lord will do what is good in his sight. Then Joab and the troops with him advanced to fight the Arameans, and they fled before him. When the Ammonites saw that the Arameans were fleeing, they fled before Abishai and went inside their city. So Joab returned from fighting the Ammonites and came to Jerusalem. After the Arameans saw that they had been routed by Israel, they regrouped. Hadadezer had Arameans brought from beyond the river. They went to Halam with Shobek, the commander of Hadadezer's army, leading them. When David was told of this, he gathered all Israel, crossed the Jordan, and went to Halam. The Arameans formed their battle lines to meet David and fought against him. But they fled before Israel, and David killed 700 of their charioteers and 40,000 of their foot soldiers. He also struck down Shobuk, the commander of their army, and he died there. When all the kings who were vassals of Hedadezer saw that they had been defeated by Israel, they made peace with the Israelites and became subject to them. So the Arameans were afraid to help the Ammonites anymore. Here ends our reading. Uh, there's a response of thankfulness that's printed for us in our bulletins there. The word of the Lord. Thanks indeed. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we are grateful, thankful to you for this, your word. It communicates to us, tells us about you, helps us to know you as we learn about you. We learn about your character, what you're like. We learn from you how you act in this world, how you defend your people and love them and bless them. And Lord, we pray that you would teach us as well from your word how we are to respond, how we are to act, being your people as we are. We pray that you would use these ancient words inspired by your spirit long ago, that you'd use them by your spirit, now present with us, to teach us about yourself and how we are to be, how we are to live, how we are to act, 
how we are to speak today. Jesus, indeed, preach to us through this, your word, which we have just read. We pray that you do so to bless us, your people, but ultimately that through our actions, through our words, that you would be honored in this world, that you would be glorified, that Jesus would be lifted up. We pray this, Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Um, some of you know one of the, the longest novels you can read, one of the things you can pat yourself on the back for is Moby Dick, and the other one is War and Peace. Um, and uh, Leo Tol Tolstoy wrote War and Peace. It's a big, huge novel. I haven't read it. I was a literature major, but I didn't read it too long. I read one of his others. Actually, we didn't have it assigned in a class, so I didn't bother. Uh, but uh, this is a passage about war and peace, uh, how war and peace was present for God's people under David, but also how war and peace are present for us today, whether we know it or think about it or, or, or not. And, and so as we look at this passage, there are a few things we can say, uh, but as a point of introduction, uh, we say this, this overall statement, and if you'd like to fill out blanks in an outline, you're welcome to do that. If you want to just listen, you can just listen, and that's okay too, however you best uh, take it in is fine. Uh, so God says to us, as a point of introduction, the key to peace, the key, the key to peace, P-E-A-C-E, -E, the key to peace in the church and your peace, or you can write in there my peace, is following Jesus, the son of David, in spiritual war. The key to peace is following David in war. If you're in the Old Testament under David, the key to our peace is the church and as individual Christians is following the son of David, Jesus, in the spiritual war that's present today. And so as a, a first point here, we, we make this statement. There is, and this is your blank here, you, there is spiritual war happening. There is spiritual war happening. We see this in, in verse 6, in verses 15 through 16, there's war happening. Uh, David and his troops and all his people are at home. Uh, David sends out uh, envoys to one of the, the kings who had been nice to him. Perhaps um, the king of the Ammonites had been nice to him when David was being chased in the wilderness by Saul. He was kind of over in that area. We don't know for sure, but David, we know from this passage, has some kind of friendship relationship with the king of the Ammonites. And, and he dies. And so David sends envoys to, this, uh, to the son who has now uh, succeeded his father as king to express sympathy, but the advisors to the son convince the son of the Ammonites that, that uh, David has sent these uh, envoys as spies so that David can come and make war. And so they, they humiliate these spies by uh, uh, cutting off half their beards, I suppose, you know, half like that. So this side was clean shaven, that side wasn't. And, and they cut their garments off halfway at the buttocks. God's word said it, so I can say it. Um, and I don't know whether that was down the middle or across the side. I'm not sure. Uh, but uh, anyway, to humiliate them. And so they come, and, and if you know the, the geography of Israel, um, the, the Ammonites were off to the east. Uh, there, were, there were a few tribes of Israel that were to the, the east of the Jordan River. And beyond these tribes, one of the nations was the Ammonites. And it's kind of straight east from Jericho, straight east from Jerusalem, roughly, um, once you cross the land that belonged to, to Israel. And, and so uh, Jericho was a, a, a city that we know from the book of Joshua that was close by the Jordan River. And so when these envoys come back and they're humiliated with their half beards and, and their incomplete um, uh, garments, um, David says, just stay in Jericho. Before they get too far in the land, he says, just stay in Jericho till your beards grow back so that you won't be humiliated. And, and so we see a little bit of Jesus' character there, don't we, through his great forebear, uh, David, uh, care for our, our, our dignity and that we're not humiliated. Um, but um, the, the king realizes that he has uh, this great expression uh, here in this passage, uh, what is it? He realizes that uh, he has um, become an offense to David's nostrils. Verse 6. 
um, that he's made David angry. And so he says, the king of the Ammonites, uh-oh. Uh, he's heard of all this conquering that David's done in chapter 8 of 2 Samuel. And so he says, uh-oh, and he gathers all these troops, and he hires out troops, and, and they, come, uh, they come to fight David. And so we see two cases of this war here. In the first phase of it, um, David wins, uh, and the, the Ammonites go back into their city, and, and so it's outside the promised land, so Joab doesn't mess with them. Um, they didn't have to mess with people who were outside the promised land. Uh, but then uh, the Ammonites, get, you know, again, ra raise up an army against David, and so David goes out himself, and, and it, so there's this battle going on in this passage, and this is instructive to us and preserved for us in Scripture because there's, there's battle for us as well. Bob read for us from Ephesians 6. That's one of the places we know that there's battle going on for us as Christians today. Uh, Paul talks about uh, spiritual battle and that we have armor and, and weapons to combat this spiritual battle. And he says, no, 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 it's not like in the Old Testament where a battle is against flesh and blood or another political party, people. It's not against people, but our battle is against the, the powers above that are evil, uh, the powers of darkness and, and of wickedness. And so we have these different spiritual weapons, things like uh, God's word and, and prayer that we, that we employ, our faith that we employ as we're in spiritual battle. Um, 1 Peter 2.11, uh, Bob read for us too. It talks about you know, the, the desires of the flesh are waging war against our souls. 1 Peter 2.11, there's war going on against our souls. War is being waged against our souls. And so for us, um, like the Old Testament people, just because God's right choice, his anointed one, his Messiah, David, and that's what Messiah means, anointed one, was reigning over the throne and in, in, in over them in Israel. Just because that was the case, it didn't mean that war wasn't going to come upon them. And we learn that from this passage. But we learn also from this for us, just because God's choice, his anointed one, Jesus, the great son of David, has been placed upon his throne in the heavenly Jerusalem, <coughs> seated there, and is reigning. Just because that's the case in our era, it doesn't mean that war is not occurring for us. And so we sit in the same place as these Israelites under David. They had the perfect king and things were as good as they had ever been in the promised land because David was on the throne. And we have the right king, God's choice for King Jesus, on the throne in heaven. So no matter, no matter where we live on earth, he's in heaven. And so he reigns over us, ruling all things for the sake of the church. We read that in Ephesians 1. But that doesn't mean war is not happening to us. And so there is war going on, but it's a spiritual war. But it is a war that's going on in your life every day. So number two, spiritual war today uh, that we see in 5, 6, and 15, 16 consists of two battles. So for us as Christians, spiritual war is two different battles, two, two sets of things that are going on that the New Testament calls war for the Christian. A, the first kind of battle, the first part of this war is in this direction. It's the battle for personal Christ-likeness. Now that's all one word. Christ, like, L-I-K-E, -E, and then Ness, like Loch Ness, N-E-S-S. -S. Okay. Uh, the battle for personal Christ-likeness. This is going on. And so we know, you know uh, Genesis 127, Men and women are created in the image of God as reflections of who God is in the world. But sin has come into the world, and so we're not accurate, totally accurate reflections of God in the world. And so there's, a, there's this war going on with our souls to conform us more and more into that image of God that we were created to be, up and against our sin natures and temptation, and Satan's temptations of us. So this war is happening to get us back to where we were created to be 
in the image of God, reflecting God in the world through saying things like he would say, doing things that he would do, having the attitudes that he would have to the people around us and to the circumstances that we're, that we're encountering. Uh, so the battle for personal Christ-likeness, we see it uh, set up for us in Genesis 1.27. Romans 8.29 says this, For those God foreknew, that's us, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of Christ. Before you were born, God predestined you not only for eternal life, but to be conformed into the image of Christ. That means in your life, you are being made more and more like Jesus. And that's a war that's going on because your sinful nature is still inside of you and battling, as, as we read from Paul in Romans 7. There's this war going on, or as, as Peter put there in 1 Peter 2.11, a, a, a war is being waged against our souls to be, for us to be conformed into the image, the likeness of Christ, to be more like Jesus in our thoughts, in our wisdom, in our uh, actions, in our words, in, in what we're doing to the people around us. Okay, so that's Romans 8.29. Uh, Ephesians 6, uh, 10 through 18, it's a whole passage about war and our souls and what's going on and how we, how we survive in this war with various weapons. Um, and so that's going on, this war for our personal Christ-likeness. And you have that going on even when you sleep. You know, sometimes I have dreams and I do the wrong thing in the dream. And there's this, this, there's this battle going on. Even when I'm dreaming, you know, I know what's right. And I do the wrong thing, you know, and, it's, and you struggle. You know, it's, and it's a Christian nightmare, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> but, but all day long, we wake up and we start in the battle. And so just know that we're, we're, we're at war. At war to be more like Christ from the moment we wake up till the next moment we wake up 24 hours later. Okay. So that's, that's part of the war. That's half the battle. The other part of the battle is this, B, the battle for kingdom expansion through evangelism. The battle for kingdom expansion through evangelism. And so uh, Joshua, uh, he goes into the land and he's doing battle um, to gain the promised land, to gain the promised inheritance for God's people. The promised land is called the people's inheritance. In the New Testament, the inheritance is heaven. That's how the New, New Testament defines inheritance for Christians. And so we are battling for the inheritance of all those God has foreknew, foreknown so that they take hold of their inheritance. We're doing Joshua battle, not against flesh and blood, but we're doing Joshua battle so that all who are God's people all whom the Father has given to Jesus will obtain their eternal inheritance. Like we read about last week in Titus 3. We have the hope of the inheritance of eternal life as Christian people. And so we're doing this battle. Again, we're not battling against people. We're battling for people that they would take hold of their eternal inheritance. We're, we're Joshua's uh, of today, so to speak. Um, Ephesians 6 19 and 20. The last part of this spiritual war passage is about this part of the battle. Paul says, pray for me that I might speak boldly the gospel as I should. Okay, this is part of the war. Part of the war is having taking the sword of the spirit. Okay, Ephesians 6, 17, taking the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, the gospel, and employing it. And when we share the gospel with somebody, when we say to somebody, in essence, Jesus is God and he forgives sins. He forgives the sins of anyone who comes to him in faith. Like we talked about last week, right? Whoever comes to the king, the son of David, receives mercy and kindness. Right? And so we employ that sword to people and we put people to the sword when we explain the gospel to them. And they can do one of two things. They can pull out their sword and fight it. No, he's not, and I will not be submissive to Jesus. Or they can bow their knee, and they can become a member of his kingdom, a citizen of heaven. Right? So that's the imagery that the New Testament gives us and that Paul's giving us here. Paul says, pray for me 
that I would be bold as I'm fighting this war with the sword of the Spirit, that more people would come to know Jesus, that more people would come into his kingdom, that Jesus' kingdom would expand. Um, in uh, Matthew uh, 28, 19, Jesus' last words to his disciples, go make disciples of all the nations. Because all authority, this is king language, all authority, I'm king, all authority has been given to me, Jesus says. So go make disciples of all nations. Expand my kingdom, he says. Engage in this war. Uh, don't be one who gets uh, one uh, uh, denarius and hides it in the field. No, take these two denarius that I've given you or these five pieces of silver and, 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 and invest them and expand them so that when I come back, my kingdom has expanded and I'll reward you. Okay. And, and then last, our last verse there, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, Paul talks about the weapons of our war are, are not fleshly, uh, they're not earthly, they're not physical, but they're divinely powerful. And, and that's weapons of the gospel. And he's going out there and he's proclaiming the gospel. And these gospels are, are knocking down uh, walls and fortresses of disbelief in individuals. Okay, So that's the second part of the war that we're in. Spiritual war today, one, is for your Christ-likeness personally. That's going on with your soul constantly through the day. Will I obey or will I submit to, my, to this temptation? And then the other part of the war is expansion of Christ's kingdom. The, the, kingdom, of, the kingdom of the great son of David, Jesus. And our, uh, uh, employing ourselves in that expansion. So that's, that's spiritual war today. So then number three. Number three. The message of this text is this, that a church can experience peace, a church can experience peace through victory in its spiritual war. So, so there's something with this. How, how do we have peace? It's not by sitting there and rolling over while, while, while these thousands of people, the Aramaeans and the, the Ammonites and, and those they've hired from other places come in and run us over. No, we got to got to follow the son of David out to war, and, and, and then we'll have peace. Okay, so peace is through, through this victory as we, follow, as we follow Jesus. Okay, so church, an individual church can experience peace also through victory in its spiritual war. Um, Romans 8, 35 through 37 says that the church is full of people who are more than conquerors. Okay, again, victory language. So we're to be a, a church who's victorious as we follow Jesus, and, and that victory brings us, brings us peace. Okay, so let's talk about this. A, in your outline there, victory spiritually, victory spiritually is, verse 12, what is good in the Lord's sight. So that's good news. The Lord wants us to win. He wants us to have victory, and he wants us to have peace. You know, Joab goes out to war in that first phase of the war, and he, he strategizes and says, okay, if I start to lose, come help me. If you start to lose, I'll come help you. Okay? But, but, okay, be strong, and we'll see what's good in the Lord's sight. And we see in this passage what's good, what's good in the Lord's sight. It's that we win. We become more Christ-like, and we gather more people into the kingdom of Jesus. Okay, so that's, that's good news and hopeful news for us. This is our victory spiritually. And the Lord wants it to happen. It's what's good in the Lord's sight. So, next line there for you. No matter what happens to you physically, know that Christ is working for your spiritual victory. And know that spiritual victory will happen. Um, again, Romans 8, 35 through 37, we're called more than conquerors. Uh, but there are no guarantees to us in Scripture of temporal, physical victory. No guarantees in Scripture that you won't uh, suffer um, a, lay a layoff. No guarantees of that. No guarantees you won't get cancer. No guarantees you won't die of an aneurysm or a heart attack or, or something like that. Um, those promises are not made. Interestingly, I was reading uh, this morning, I think it was Luke uh, 21. It may have been Luke 20. And Jesus is talking about um, 
you know, not, not fearing um, that, that not a head, you will be, uh, uh, um, you will be persecuted, you'll be brought before authorities, you'll be jailed, um, but not a hair of, he says, don't worry, not a hair of your head will be touched and they'll kill you. <laughs> So it doesn't mean you'll you'll die and your product will work, your grill cream or your sculpting gel or whatever, and your hair won't be messed up when you die. But what Jesus is saying is this: you know, there are no guarantees. He's saying Christians will die for their faith. He's promising that to his disciples. Jesus is. But in the midst of that, he says, "And not a hair of your head will be touched." And so we say, "Okay." So we know historically that Christians die for their faith. So what does he mean by not a hair of your head will be touched? It's this, it's this care. It's the spiritual care of us. It's a, a figurative expression. If you read the whole passage there, you'll see that that's what he's talking about. And, and, and that, you know, if they kill your body, they can't kill your soul. And so just, just know that as a Christian person in this life, um, you know, you, you, you may, uh, as uh, Betsy's dad would say, die a horrible death. Uh, <laughs> you don't want to die a horrible death. Um, but, and you may. And Christians today, because of their faith in other parts of the world, will die a horrible death. But they will be cared for. Not a hair of their head will be touched, so to speak. Uh, and, and so that's the, the spiritual aspect of this. It's spiritual victory. And this is what the book of Revelation talks about. It talks about those who have died for their faith have died victoriously through the word of their testimony. That is, they die victoriously because even though it costs them their physical life, they remain true to the Lord, true to their faith in Jesus. And when they died, they got to see Jesus. And they were victorious even though they were killed. So, so know that about our faith. It's a spiritual victory that we're guaranteed. Through Jesus, your sins are forgiven. Through Jesus, your faith in him, you will see him when you die. Through Jesus, when he comes back, you will be with him in the new heavens and new earth. That is guaranteed for you. You are more than a conqueror, but it doesn't mean you can dunk a basketball. It doesn't mean that you will become CEO of your company. It doesn't mean that you'll be all league or all state. It doesn't mean that you'll win the piano competition. Those, those promises are not made in Scripture, the physical promises. We, God just tells us, be faithful. Be faithful to me. And I'll take care of the victory for you, but it's a, it's a, it's a spiritual victory for now. Um, and then B. Uh, so... Uh, the spiritual victory um, is what is good in the Lord's sight, and this war is led by D the son of David, Jesus. Uh, we see that David is in charge of this, this fighting, both in verse 7 when he sends Joab out and verse 17 when he himself leads the troops out. Jesus, the son of David, is in charge of things. And in Revelation 6, 2, we see that Jesus is the one riding out on his white horse with his crown, with his bow, riding out as a conqueror bent on conquest. Again, holding out that, that sword of the Spirit, the gospel to people, and, and bringing them into submission into his good kingdom, to love them, to care for them, and to protect them. So this war is led by the son of David, Jesus. And then C, these spiritual victories in the church bring the church peace in three ways. These spiritual victories that are guaranteed to us, these spiritual victories that we're called to, this, this war that we're in, um, the victories in the war bring peace to us in the church in three ways. Um, and look in verse 19. Everybody look at verse 19 kind of the punchline, I kind of had a pleasant experience um, this, this week, and I always have pleasant experiences preparing gospel lessons. It's always just wonderful. I, I love doing it. I was at the uh, rehearsal dinner uh, for Larissa's wedding two, three Fridays ago, two weeks ago, and a guy said, I can't believe what you do. I mean, every week you're up there and you're preaching. I mean, how do you, how do you have that much to say? And it's like, well, I don't have that much to say. The good news is, you know, it's like this 
God has much to say. And, and you know, you've heard me before, you know, my professor said, see, so you won't have problem filling 20 minutes. You'll have problems sitting down um, and not going for three hours. And that's the truth with God's, with God's word. But a pleasant experience uh, this week because a lot of times I can I look at a passage and, you know, I've been at this. This is like Sermon 1013, I think, for me. Okay. I just started numbering them when I started off. So I've been at this a while, 20 years, every week, 50, 50 to 52 weeks a year, okay? And so a lot of times I can look at a passage and, and it's like, okay, boom, 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 see it. Here it is. Boy, this is good. It's not something I saw before. It's just, you know, boom, there it is. Um, uh, but, but this is a passage where as I worked on the sermon through it, it kept getting revised and reshaped and more clear and, and about uh, actually, about two thirds away through, I saw verse 19. And I said, "Boom! There's the punchline, right there." Yeah, and and, and so um, look, look there, verse 19. What's the result of this war and God's people following David in war? What's the result of the victory? Why do they care if they have victory or not? Um, and verse verse 19 here. If I can find the little 19 in my Bible. There we go. When all the kings who were vassals of Hedadezer saw that they had been defeated by Israel, they made peace with the Israelites and became subject to them. Punchline. Into the chapter. Right? Into the episode. Two huge armies amassed against David. All Israel follows David. And what's the result? Peace. And anyone who was warring, being subject, no longer causing trouble. And so um, peace in three ways come to the church today. We don't have anyone physically warring against us, trying to burn down our houses. Uh, but we have peace uh, in other ways that come to us. So three ways. The first way, first of all, number one there in your outline, there's eternal, eternal peace in the church. This is peace that comes with justification if you know that word um, that is this non-believers here's the kind of peace we're talking about eternal peace non-believers who come to faith as a result of our evangelism battle get peace with god as god forgives their sins so as we follow jesus who's riding out like a, a like a, a on a white horse like a conqueror bent on conquest as we follow jesus in this this attempt to, to, I always want to say conquest, conquer souls, um, and we spread the gospel, and we say to people, Jesus is God, and he forgives sins. And as they believe, they get peace. That's our declaration of the gospel this morning. If you look in your front page there, Romans 5.1. We have, since we've believed, how, how's, it, how's it put it there? We have justification through faith. Peace with God through faith in Jesus Christ. And so victory in this war on the evangelism front means, pe means peace. Spiritual war for the souls of men and women brings peace. Just like this physical war for David and the people of Israel meant peace at the end. That's the final reward. Peace is brought to Israel instead of war. And so as the church goes out with the message of the gospel, peace expands. Um, Colossians 1.21 says this, Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but in Christ, Colossians 1.14, in Christ we have the forgiveness of sins. So with this, this war being fought by the church, this war of evangelism, this, this gospel going out, people go from being alienated and at war with God, hostile toward him, engaged in evil deeds, to being at peace with him because of the forgiveness of their sins. Okay. So that's one way, of, uh, one way of peace. We're justified through faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, so we and all who become willing uh, to bow the knee uh, to the son of David, Jesus, get peace. Um, so there's, there's this peace in this way. We all, in a sense, 
become like the vassal kings, don't we, of Hedadezar. Um, see there in verse 19, a vassal king was a king who was conquered, but he was left on his throne, but he has to submit to the greater king. Okay? And so these vassal kings were under Hedadezer, and they look and they see, man, Israel's wiped out everyone. And they come and they make peace with David. They say, hey, we never really wanted to fight in the first place. <laughs> or something like that. They make peace with David. And that's what we do when we believe the gospel. We say, you know what? Jesus, um, I don't want to fight you anymore. Son of David, I don't want to fight you anymore. I, I just, I'll, I'll, accept your, I'll accept your terms of peace. I'll become subject to you. Now, I hope you're getting memorized um, the, uh, uh, um, our, um, declaring our faith. We keep doing it over and over again. Uh, Westminster uh, Shorter Catechism 26. How does Christ carry out the office of a king? Christ carries out the office of a king like David did in subduing us to himself. That's his first order of business. He takes his bow, riding on his white horse, and he, he gets us to be subject to himself. Because we were enemies, hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds. And the first thing he does is he subjugates us. And we say, I'm so glad he did. Because that's subjugation, my submission to him, that he worked in me has brought me peace. I have peace with God. Because he went to war against me and said, but I have, I have terms of peace. You want to take them? And he opened our eyes to see those terms of peace. And we say, that's far better than fighting with you for the rest of my life and being apart from you for all eternity. Okay? And so he submits, he subdues us to himself. He rules us and defends us. Um, and he restrains and conquers all uh, his and our enemies as well. Um, so we have eternal peace. Um, like the vassal kings of Hedadizar does. Um, so there's peace in that way and the spiritual battle of evangelism led by Jesus. Your A point there, like the Israelites called by David to fight, you must listen to Jesus for your opportunities. You can write in the word my. Listen to Jesus for your opportunities to fight for, fight for the souls of unbelievers. Look for opportunities to listen to Jesus looking for opportunities to fight for the souls of the unbelievers around you to bring to them eternal peace. David called all Israel to come and fight. That is all the soldiers there. Um, and, and we're told in, in Ephesians 6, we're soldiers. Take up your battle gear, Paul says. He calls all of us to, to fight uh, for the souls of people. So look for those opportunities for the non-believers around you. It doesn't mean they'll come to faith right away, but, but it means speak a word. Speak a word about Jesus when he gives you opportunity to speak of him. And you're speaking for their sake. Okay? In other words, B in your outline here, this is not a fight against your neighbors. We're not fighting against non-believers. We're not fighting against our neighbors to make our neighborhoods nicer. Behave. I don't like the way you are acting. It's not why we're talking to them. We're not fighting against them. They're not the enemies. Our enemies are not flesh and blood, Paul says. We're fighting for them. We're presenting to them terms of peace, the gospel. And we're pleading with them, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5. We're pleading with you. Be reconciled to God. We want your good. Be like these vassal kings. Not like that crumb bum of a son uh, under, the Ammonite, uh, under the Ammonite king. Uh, but rather, we speak for people. That's our attitude. We love our neighbors. Okay? And so we speak the gospel to them. We're not fighting against them, uh, but we're fighting for them, for their, for their eternal salvation. Now, number two, number two. Secondly, because of Jesus' victory over death and his ascension to heaven, because of Jesus' victory, there's personal 
experiential peace. Okay, so first of all, there's eternal peace in the church. That is, people have peace with God. They go to heaven when they die. They're in the new heavens and new earth. But secondly, in your life now, in our era, there's experiential peace because of Jesus' victory. That is, A, there in your outline, after his victory over the grave, he ascended to heaven and was able to make all believers temples, temples of his Holy Spirit, whom he sent from heaven. 1 Corinthians 6.19 says that we as believers are temples of the Holy Spirit whom we have from God. Jesus, as he's talking with his disciples, says, it's good that I go away, for when I go away, I will send you my spirit, the comforter. I'll send him to you, and that will be good for you. And so we are temples of the Holy Spirit, and having the Holy Spirit, we have peace. So be there in your outline. With the Spirit of God dwelling in you, with the Spirit of God dwelling in each believer, we have gained a supernatural, experiential, and here's your blank, continuing and now normal peace in our souls. Because Jesus has had a victory over, over temptation, and over the grave, and has risen up in victory to heaven and sent his spirit. We have peace in our souls, and that's an experiential peace that we have. A peace that we have in our lives that replaces the feelings of dread and chaos and guilt that Paul talks about in Romans 1 that are present in the non-believer who has nothing to look forward to when he looks to his death except judgment and the fact that he's in trouble. And there's no solution for that because he's a sinner. But Jesus gives us peace in our souls through his Holy Spirit dwelling in us. And this is what Bob read for us in Galatians 5.22, the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Because the Holy Spirit is in you, you have peace. An experiential peace is a basis or a, a baseline in your life instead of chaos instead of guilt uh, instead of anxious anxiousness um, and then see our response to this be thankful be thankful to jesus for the internal peace he's won for you he's given you his spirit through the spirit is peace be thankful for the internal peace that he has won for you by sending you his spirit be Here's your next blank, loyal to him for it, always realizing that he is the key by his Spirit's work to your peace. By yourself, no peace. By his Spirit in your life, peace. So be grateful. He sent the Spirit to be in your soul so that you could be a temple of his Spirit and you have peace. The peace you experience is because of his Spirit in you. So be grateful. Be grateful, be thankful, and be loyal to Jesus. He's done this for you. He's the key to you, your having peace. And then thirdly, because of Jesus' victory over death and his ascension to heaven, there's in the church not only uh, the, the peace we have eternally, peace with God, not only uh, a peace that we have experientially in our souls, peace in our souls, but there's relational social peace in the church because of Jesus' victory. There's social, relational peace. Just as the vassal king, vassal king nations were because of David's victory over them, now living in relational peace with the people of God, so too, because of Jesus' victory and his sending of, your spirit, sending of his spirit to you, you can be in relational, social peace with the people of God, like these vassal kings. Okay, we're the vassal kings at this point. We're not at war anymore with other people who would say, I'm, yeah, I'm one of the people of God. And so in the church, this is the norm. This is what Paul talks about in Ephesians 2. In the church, the norm is that we're at peace with one another. There's relational, social peace in the church. Why is this, why is this so? A. By his spirit and believers, by his spirit and believers, Jesus wins the battle for our Christ-likeness. Okay, so we've talked about this before, now it's relating to this point. By his, by his sending you his spirit, 
by his putting his spirit in you, Jesus is winning the battle for you becoming more and more like Christ. You're becoming greater in your Christ likeness, more and more like Jesus. And so then be following with this, because by his spirit you can put to death our, your sin nature and obey God's commands. And this is what uh, 2 Peter 1, 3 through 7 were about. God by his spirit has given you everything you need for life and godliness. That's what Peter says there in 2 Peter. God has given you everything. His divine power, the spirit in you, has given everything you need for life and godliness. This means by his spirit, he's making you more and more like Jesus. And he names all these characteristics that flow from having God's spirit in you. And so uh, you're, you're putting to death your sin nature and you're starting to walk more in God's commandments like Jesus did. Jesus walked in all of God's commandments, obeying them all. And so um, we're putting these to death. Um, then C, with sin natures being put to death, this is a stair step, this is a ladder here that we're going through. C, with sin natures being put to death and us hence being made more like Jesus, Members in the church being more made more like Jesus with their sin natures being put to death are becoming more, here's your blank, becoming more loving and forgiving of each other, more loving and forgiving, more considerate of one another, treating each other as more important than themselves. Treating, them, treating each other as more important than themselves and walking in humility toward one another. Okay, so 1 Peter 1.22 says, Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth and others, you believe the gospel, have a, you have a sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply from the heart. Because Jesus has won his victory, he's in heaven, because, and from that victory has sent you his spirit, you can love your brothers and sisters deeply, sincerely from the heart. Now, if your brother and sister in the church is loving you sincerely and deeply from the heart, what's that mean for the peace between you and him, between you and her? It increases, doesn't it? Colossians 3.13, Paul writes, Bear with each other and forgive. Forgive whatever grievances you have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. So here's what this means. The spirit in you, the consequence of Christ's victory, means that you're forgiving each other. So the church is a place where, by the spirit, the members of it are forgiving each other. And what happens when people are forgiving each other? There is greater peace in that group. When there's no forgiveness, there's war. When there's forgiveness, there's peace. Philippians 2, verse 1. If you have any, any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose, doing nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Here's what Paul says. If you have fellowship with the Spirit with me, I've got the Spirit, Paul says, if you have the Spirit too, which you do, then walk in humility toward one another and consider each other in the church as more important than yourself. Consider their needs above your needs. Again, what does that do to peace in the church? book of Philippians is all about peace. Yodia and Syntyche were arguing. That's why Paul writes the book. Okay, so it goes through all this rigmarole, explaining how Jesus establishes peace amongst us. And then, in, you know, finally, toward the end of the book, he says, now Yodia and Syntyche, brothers, have these two get along. <laughs> but that's, that's it. By the Spirit, by considering, by walking in humility toward one another, we treat each other as more important than ourselves. And that, brings, that brings peace in the church. So this is the third kind of peace in the church. Relational peace. Social peace. 
in the church, and it's brought about by more Christ-likeness in each of us. As we become more like Christ, the peace in the church increases. Because, you know, if someone treats me like Christ treats me, I'm not going to be at war with that person. Right? Even Jesus said, it's easy to be nice to people who are nice to you. So if the church is a place where everyone's being nice to you, you're just not going to be at war. Right? So, D, this Christ-likeness described above and C there, this Christ-likeness uh, brought about in our lives by the Holy Spirit, sent to us from victorious Jesus, means the church can be a place of relational peace. It's just summarizing what we've said here. This Christ-likeness means the church can be a place of relational peace. So we owe our peace in the church to Jesus. We owe our peace in the church to Jesus sending us his spirit. We owe our peace in the church to his spirit conforming us into the image of Jesus and making us treat each other like Jesus has treated us. And then E, thus you are, here's your application point for this part of the peace, uh, thus I am to live by the Spirit, battling against the desires of my sinful nature, as Galatians 5.16 said, Bob read that for us. Because one, this will conform me to the image of Christ. Okay, as I battle against my sinful nature, as I engage in this battle for my own Christ-likeness with the power of the Holy Spirit in me, walking in Christ's ways, this will conform me to the image of Christ. What's Jesus' character? Jesus' character is doing everything the Father commanded. Jesus perfectly fulfills the law. He loves his neighbor as he loves himself. He treats his neighbor justly. He exercises mercy. He's kind. He's compassionate. He's understanding. And as we are conformed to Jesus' image, we are like this too. We're conformed to the image of Christ as we are walking uh, in the ways of God uh, commanded in Scripture. And then number two, um, as you do this, as you live by the Spirit, as you walk by the Spirit in Christ's ways, you're not only made, in the Im made more and more in the image of Christ, but you also become a contributor, a contributor to the relational peace in your church. Churches can vary on how much relational peace is in the church. We have a ton, you know, so we're, I think we're top percentile. So don't be proud about that because what gets us there is humility, right? We have relational peace in the church, not at war with one another, being gracious and patient and, and forgiving uh, with each other, assuming, as uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 13, love means assuming the best of others, um, uh, of, of understanding and having compassion on people when they're short with us. Because we're short with people and we're tired and that kind of thing. Um, but, but our role is to be a contributor to the peace in the church through walking in the ways of Christ, being a, a, a forgiver, being someone who's compassionate, being someone who's understanding. And so a church can, can have a high level of peace as people are more and more conformed to the image of Jesus as they walk in his ways by his spirit. So Paul says in Ephesians 2.14, I say live by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. The sinful nature wants you to hold a grudge. The sinful nature wants you to not forgive. The sinful nature wants you to say, you know what, they did this to me or they said this to me once. That's the sinful nature and that's Satan trying to break, bring disunity and discord and a lack of peace in the church. But David calls all Israel to be a part of the peace, verse 19, that he wants to establish for his people. He wants everyone to contribute, and that's our assignment as Christians. I can be a contributor to the peace in this church that I'm in, whether it's this church or you move away in some other church somewhere else. You can be, that's your role, be a contributor to the peace of the church. Okay, so summary, summary. There's a spiritual war going on. There's a spiritual war going on, and it's for souls on the one hand, so more people come to faith, and it's for your Christ-likeness. 
And it's constantly going on, this war. All day long, we are confronted with opportunities to become more like Jesus, to follow him, to say no to temptation, to walk in his ways, to say no to our sinful nature. And all day long, we're interacting with non-believers and, and sorting through you know, ways we can say something about Jesus that'll help people. I feel terrible because when that guy said to me two weeks ago on a fr Friday, boy, how do you do that every week? I just, even yesterday morning, I was thinking, I should have been more clear in my answer about how rich God's word is and how I'm not inventing anything. I'm just saying what God has there for us. And, and I, was, I, I remember in the instant of it, just struggling with it, because I say that to you guys. When you guys say, boy, that was a great sermon, I say, I'm glad I don't have to come up with that. This is God's word, and isn't it rich? Right? So I just say that automatically for Christians, but I was trying to convert that and translate. I, was, I outsmarted myself because he was not a believer. And I should have just said what I said to all you folks. I felt like I didn't give a good, I, I didn't, I get, didn't give a good, as good a witness there as I could have. And I, I should have been more alert as, you know, people knew I was a pastor, you know, there in that setting. So I should have walked myself through questions that might come up or things people might say. But that's a war, you know, and, and, and we're at war and you're, you know, in your class or at your workplace or in your neighborhood and war is going on and Satan wants us to be asleep as to that war going on. Um, and, and so that war is going on for our Christ-likeness and for the souls of people, but going on in your summary there, following your, following your King Jesus, you must fight, fight for both, um, for both of those, that there might be peace, peace in the promised land of your church, that more people might come to faith in Jesus through our church. And that relationally, experientially, and with God, that we would have, this church would be a place of great peace. Let's pray.